afternoon. Um, I'm pleased to introduce you guys, uh, Ken Chang Chen and Serena Villalobos. Uh, Ken Chang is a cybersecurity researcher at the School of Information at UC Berkeley, focusing on enterprise information and security architecture. Serena Villalobos is a cybersecurity professional focused on governance, risk, and compliance with extensive experience in the healthcare industry and HIPAA. They will be presenting a talk titled Applied Privacy Engineering Study on SEER Database. Please me join me. <laughs> I hope I spell correctly. Please me join welcoming Ken and Serena. Thank you. Well, it's good thing that uh, during lunchtime, I request a few of you to come to this session. So I guess we don't, we have a full seat here right now. Appreciate everyone coming. <laughs> so uh, my name is Ken, uh, I've been introduced. I um, uh, consider myself uh, currently focused on cybersecurity research. So cybersecurity, there's many different perspectives of it, right? So what we're gonna talk about today is the data privacy. It's just one of the domain uh, in the information security field that is much relevant to what you do as a data scientist. Hopefully today, at the end result, we will be able to share a mutual understanding that why data privacy is important. So I guess everyone want to have a physical privacy at home, right? Uh, you probably don't want people to see you naked at home. That is your personal privacy. It's a physical space. So in the digital world, right, where we have so many personal data is being shared across the world, that is the, your privacy at the risk. So think about the consequence for that, where your digital privacy being in the violation, uh, where uh, some information about you is being disclosed without your consent. Will you be happy about it? I guess not. Because in the way that the data science is trying to using the personal data and other data linkage to be able to produce a predictable result to help our society. But in the meantime, there will be a huge risk on the security side that your personal privacy might be at the risk. So that's what we want to use in a serious database, which is a cancer registry database, to help you to understand that your health data, if you are a cancer patient, I hope you're not in this audience, but if you have a family member on a cancer patient, their data is actually potentially is at the risk. So there's a lot of law and regulation in this space, uh, particularly um, GDPR, everyone should know about it, right? This is from the European nation about how you should collecting, processing the consumer data and also allow the consumer to make a collection if they see it's needed. So particularly GDPR and the Con California Consumer Privacy Act, they have very similar principle. It's allow you as a personal data holder be able to have a chance to have a voice on how their data, your data being processed and be collected. And there's other law and regulation, uh, such as US privacy law in the 1974. That one, it actually only applied to the government. So United States, you can think about is that at the data privacy level, we are pretty advanced because in the 1974, the Congress already think about the data privacy, but unfortunately that law is only applied to the government agencies. But think about the bureaucracy of the government agency. Do you trust your data to be protected by the government? Probably not, right? So how effective those law and regulation are, including the HIPAA, the, uh, the health care space, that is something that is, 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 is in this industry that at the security space, we are looking at the stronger enforcement on the law and regulation enforcement to help the data science community to understanding that why, why the data privacy is important. So an example of this is where you probably know that already that uh, Facebook got fined with the $5 billion with FTC. So 
why you why you probably think that why FTC the Federal Trade Commission is involved in this space? And so, particular FTC, they are using the angle about is your business is providing a trustworthy agreement between you, you as a service provider, to your consumer about are you doing what you promised the consumer is doing by protecting their data by making sure their data is not being shared without their consent. So the, the, in the result, the FTC settlement with this $5 billion, it's just a showcase for FTC to tell the corporation that is developing the product and making the, the profit from the data processing, you should be careful about it. So that is basically the, in this case. So then now with the GDPR, right? So the GDPR, particularly if you think about the, the life cycle of the data. So the life cycle data has uh, the consent collection. They introduce a concept about, about controller and processor. Then of course, they actually asked you as the data uh, collection agency, you need to disclose and make sure the retention is being respected. So with that, there's a case that from Google is actually being fined with 50 million euro about their privacy policy is not clear or not transparent to the end user con uh, consumer. So that is another way that the, the law and regulation is imposing the data privacy on the product that you are producing. And the biggest one, the currently is unregulated, is this inference threat. So think about where if you are collecting those data and producing a, a, a predictable result about a person's their preference, you might in the result of the predict, making a prediction of something that in violation to their privacy. So inference threat is something about that you are unintentionally linking all the data set available about personal data. Although those data set could be already de identified. But uh, because the result of the linking, you still be able to make prediction about a sensitive information about a person. So that is where the inference threat is about. A perfect example is where everyone knows about is 2006 with Netflix, right? So Netflix at that time, uh, they try to be very innovative about predicting uh, what is the consumer's their preference about what's the video they like, what's the game they like. So they can actually make in a subscription uh, in depending to the user's preference. So they actually have this campaign where they actually say, okay, whoever can uh, create the algorithm uh, which is creating the improvement of 10% or based on what the country is doing, you, uh, we could, you could win a billion dollar. And so from there, uh, one month later, a scientist uh, at from UT Texas, uh, they actually uh, find out the linkage between the Netflix published data with other data, so they can actually identify that person with their preference. So although Netflix is published data which is already de-identified, however, we, because the data linkage, they actually can find out who that person is. So that is a, a good example of the inference threat. So with that, the biggest problem of the data processing, of processing the personal data, from my perspective, is the trust. The trust between your product, your service, using the personal data, and making prediction. But however, those prediction will end up, come back to haunt the a person providing that data. In ha with that, you become a sucker of the distrust. So that distrust is the end result of either that me, as a consumer, I will be withdrawing from your service. I'm not going to do a business with you. And you're losing the business from the end. So from that perspective, a trust between the data provider, which is the data subject, which is the consumer itself, and the service that you're providing that, as a data science, you try to do a good intention by using the data and making people's life better, but you might make worse and become a distrust. So 
uh, a quick summary about the privacy engineering principles. So particularly if you look at the, the circle where between the security and privacy, uh, from the security perspective, what we're looking for is a typical security measure is that we want to make sure that you uh, only the authorized person have access to that data. And that data, of course, well, scope is only about the personal data. So personal data could be including the PRI, PCI, which is the payment card information, and all the PHI, which is health information. So, but on the privacy side, you are, uh, the data science is actually heavily depending on the personal data to make a prediction. And the part of, by the part, like by part of that prediction of using those personal data is something that at the privacy scope is something we care. So if you look at the possible disclosure threat uh, that is in the space, uh, the identity disclosure, attribute disclosure, and membership disclosure is those are three category of the attack could happen on the personal data processing. Because the, our capability of grabbing different data set and making the linkage of it and is making those attack possible. And so particularly what we want to do uh, is look at adding one more domain here. So we will look at the security and privacy perspective. And but now we're adding the utility. So with all these three together, what you see is where between the security and utility, that's the typical uh, constraint that your information security department is trying to impose on saying that, okay, you need to make sure that you have correct access to access those data. So the least privilege principle is being applied between the security and utility. But on the security and the privacy space, uh, typically the GDPR, uh, Ca California Consumer Privacy Law, uh, is something related to uh, the space con conjunction between the security and the privacy. Now with utility and privacy, that's where on the security side, we want to, m uh, on the privacy side, we want to make sure that you have minimal data that in order for you to do your, your job to make prediction. But on the utility side, because that constraint, you might reduce your capability or increase your computing load in order to get the same result. So that's where this three different domain in the dynamic of how they actually look at the personal data. So is this is a talk of war between the privacy and utility? In the way you probably think that is. It's because where if your company is trying to produce a product as quickly as they can and use as much as the data that they can get. But the the risk of the privacy is in a way that they try to restrict how much data you can consume. Is this is the two side is fighting each other? So that's why the privacy engineering is trying to devise a more practical approach so it can make both happen in a union. So with that, I want to transfer that to the Serena to talk about our finding on serious database. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, for attending this, this um, lecture. We decided to do a project regarding um, how sensible it's the privacy in a sensible field, which is the healthcare. So we did this, um, we call it the demand for privacy for uh, can cancer patients. Ken and I and two other collaborators work on this with an advising professor at UC Berkeley. So we are, um, can you please move to the next one? Okay. So the, there are some statistics about cancer. You know, we decided cancer, honestly, because we were looking for data sets. So basically this study works with data sets that, are, that have been published. So these data sets are static. These are not the ones that you go and um, interact with, so you run queries that it's, also part of privacy engineering, but this study only covers the data sets that are static. So these are uh, published data sets. You know, once the data set is published, it's published. So it is out there um, for the community to use it. So think about 
census information, um, so many other uh, studies data sets. Okay, so the statistics about cancer tell us that it is an illness that basically touches a lot of people around the world. So that was our background to, uh, uh, like our motivation to go after the cancer research. Can we please? So one of the like, regulations that we think should be applied for healthcare is the HIPAA. Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. HIPAA has two major rules. One is privacy, the other one is security. So the security rule says that whenever your information is in a digital format, like a published data set, um, it, it should be covered by HIPAA. However, uh, our research concluded that the SEER database it's not really completely covered by HIPAA because they are not uh, considered covered entities. Um, it is a lot of, you know, uh, terms behind this, but basically our point is that even though there is regulation for the healthcare industry and the cancer register is a healthcare part of the healthcare industry, they are not really covered by HIPAA. Can we please move? Okay, so CIR, it's a cancer registry uh, that collects cancer information demographics. Um, uh, there is a lot of information, very useful for research. And uh, you can see the cancer registry is not completely for the United States, but it's, you know, pretty, uh, pretty well used, especially in California, since we are here in California. So all the information about uh, cancer patients go to this registry. Um, part of our study also included same raw data uh, published by another country, so we selected another country, which is, we're not going to talk about that, but just to let you know, to, to compare what was what we were going to see. So our objective was to demonstrate that even though the information has been um, anonymize, like you say, okay, they are not sharing me, not the username, I mean, the, the name of the, 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 the patient, first name or last name, maybe not the date of birth. So you say, okay, that is uh, the anonymized. You might have think that under PHI, you should be removing like about 18 different uh, identifiers. But uh, still, even though that information was anonymized, when the data set was published, we determined that you can identify and link every single um, patient to the real name. So that is something that we didn't do because that is um, against the, the agreement that we signed with SEER, but you are going to see that somebody with, you know, we are uh, honest people, but some other people with some different interests could be just doing this as well. Now, what happened? For example, in SEER, it is really easy to get access to the, to the data. So it is published. It's not that you go and download it right away. You say, okay, well, they have some sort of um, vetting process. Well, the vetting process is simply that you send an email and you ask them, I want to have access to the data. And they send you a format, a piece of paper, like is you know, like eight items on it and you sign it. And you promise that uh, you are not going to link it to another database. That means that somehow they are aware under the privacy engineering principles that you can easily link one of the rows or at least one with uh, another data set. And one, by linking those, you can get a full profile of the person whose information is in that data set. Then, well, see, just give you a username and password, you get the data, you put it in your computer, and you can start running, you know, whatever, just looking for information. You can print it out, you can do whatever you want. So, in our um, research, we found that in cancer research, there are kind, we identify three different groups of users that could be interested in using the SEER uh, 
data that was published that is research, you know? That is the whole purpose of SEER. The other one is what we call operations, so that like, for example, for wellness conferences, for support groups, for um, drug, drug trials, and the rest is for the public, for whoever wants to, you know, reach information, reach patients with information about, I don't know, treatments or, I know, insurances or, you know, some, any weird kind of use for this information. Please move to the other one. So, under privacy engineering, there are certain um, measures, or that 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 you that you have to run against the data set. One of them is what we call the K anonymity. So the K anonymity is basically you have a data set like this. Remember, this is published, so you just have it. It's a static, but. Um, by this one, you define quasi-identifiers. So you have the data set, you have the attributes, which are, you know, every single one of the columns. And then you have what you call quasi-identifiers. So those are the identifiers where you're going to run the analysis to see what is the value for canonymity. Let me tell you, you don't want to have a canonymity equals to one. Why? Because that means that you are able to link one one row, one tuple from here to if you link it to another data set, you're going to find who this person is, even if you don't have the name. The name is not here. You just have the gender. In our quest identifiers, we have gender, age, marital status, and race. Just with that, I I will be able to 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 locate uh, a record and find out who this person is. To me, personally, it's scary. So the same one here. We have another one with uh, this is in, so if we have this table, we have this one is just one like value, unique value. This is another unique value, and this one what we call classes. So this class will have um, two tuples in it. Um, but just because we have one of these, we know that the k anonymity for this data set is one, which is bad. You don't want it to be one. Can we please move for that? So basically, the reason why we use um, k anonymity for this specific data set is because th there are other measures, again, uh, to be studied against a data set. But um, k anonymity is the easiest one to 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 run, to prove, and to test. Um, it provides a uh, protection uh, against um, dis uh, identity disclosure. You know, to be able not to identify uh, specifically one one person, but it is just by running it and make, making sure that the, your data set is not. Um, vulnerable, vulnerable that your canonymity is more than one, so one or over could be good. Uh, it, you are still um, vulnerable to attacks for attribute and membership. So those are the ones that can mention attributes that when you can tell that a person belongs to a certain group. Like for example, I will be able to tell uh, if a person has cancer, for example that it's attribute disclosure and um, membership, I'm sorry, that is membership disclosure. Attribute is when you know what happened, that you get to know the value of one of those um, attributes. Like for example, if you're running, uh, you have a census database about income and you just have ranges of income, uh, um, Attribute disclosure attack might allow you to know that that person is either low income or high income, even not knowing the person, but you can specifically identify. So that is also scary eh, because that is your personal information. You don't want that to happen. Um, we are going to use also um, Mondrian. There are some algorithms that you run against the data set to de-anonymize it. But then you need to be careful because if you de-anonymize too much the data set, then you lose uh, utility. 
So that is the talk word that, that King was talking about. How much uh, utility versus privacy I want to have in a data set. So if I, you know, anonymize everything, I will have zero utility because, I mean, region, United States, uh, age, unknown, uh, race, unknown. So that, it's, that becomes really zero utility for whatever purpose you have for the data, the, the data set. So um, that's why we wanted to run Mandrian, because Mandrian is an algorithm. It's well studied, and it's been published. Uh, that allows you to do this de-anonymization more efficiently. So it is better uh, the anonymization um, the, the disadvantage of Mandrian is that you don't really care about the information in your data set. So it just goes and um, anonymizes, like group uh, the information, but it doesn't care under which concept you grouped. So you can say, OK, I'm going to group, like I'm not going to show male or female. I'm just going to say person. So you have the anonymized entire data set at some point. But it, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense, because if you are doing some research about male or female, then you are losing that specific information. So that is not a good uh, anonymization. So that's why we need to um, decide to run Mandian. OK. And the other, um, something that we call a, that is important measure is the discernibility cost. And um, that it's the, the average size of the class. So the class is the, the, the group of records that, ha that share the same um, attributes. And you just basically want to make sure that the discernibility cost is not too high, because that means that your that uh, balance between utility and privacy is not good. The, the higher it is, and let me explain you this, because we're going to see some, some graphs next. Um, the, the higher it is, less utility you have. The lower it is, you have more utility, but less privacy. Can we please move to the next one? So uh, this is what we call Mondrian art, that Ken wanted to, to speak a little bit about that. Well, so Mondrian basically is a multiple dimension partition. Um, so as you probably recall that we, on our quasi identifier, which is the attribute that potentially can be linked to different data set from cancer data, so we talk about identity disclosure, that attack. The biggest problem is that the data set can be linked by the common attributes. So the quasi-identifier has been chosen by the potential that how they can be linked from the cancer data set to the other data set has similar attributes. So Mondrian is a multiple partition, multiple, multiple dimension partition. So Mondrian R is something you probably saw people like hang in their home or at the art gallery. It's a beautiful art. But because for this, is two dimension. And so we try to study that in the quasi identifier, we have three or four attributes that become three to four dimensions. This diagram cannot, we don't have a good Mondrian way to actually to show you that diagram. So what we're going to do is going to look at the disassembility dis cost and the uh, C average to look at the equivalent classes of their distribution and find out that what is the best utility that we can provide while pre pre preserving the privacy. And so our setting particularly is that we look at the serial database. We have look at the data uh, query from the serial database is from 1991 to 2000. And so uh, we have the total outcome is the over 300k record. So we choose the quasi identifier as those four quasi identifier you, you've seen. Um, we run different k value. So as Serena suggests that k equal to one is the worst anonymity you can have because that's where you can actually use that particular record and identify uh, a person. So we try to raise the K into a larger scope. So we, 
we try the small range from one to seven. We also look at another data set with a higher, uh, a, a better resolution. So we look at one to 1,000 with 25 increment of the K. Um, so we then the result of that is where we look at the uh, different data set on different years. We found out that there's so many records that has the K value as one. So those records indicating that that is the potential linkage that could in resolve the identity disclosure on those records. Um, and with that, what we also try to find out is where based on the utility that we have to measure while preserving the privacy, these are the two uh, metrics that we try to measure based on the equivalent cost that we have calculated based on the Mondrian algorithm. And the, the graph that we have shown with this two tell us that the K value uh, particularly if you look at the year 2000 data, the k value has uh, starting growing very fast, uh, and you will see that the cost is also growing. And so what we try to see is that we, we cannot have a larger k. From a privacy perspective, we want to have very large k. But from the utility side, we want to have, you want to have a smaller k, because you want to have as much as data you have to analyze. So that's where we try to find a balance on what is the right K value to be. And so particularly if you see this, is that this is one of the metrics that we measure. So we look at that, the growth rate and, and look at the where, uh, how we actually look at the utility side and to see that maybe K t around K20 is the good. But we actually look at the different data actually to asserting that. So this is the average equivalent class size we actually doing another measure on the same data set. And we look at the C average that when the K value is getting large, you can see that is the C average is decreasing. So those two measures, you see that it's actually going to a different direction. But however, we can find that when the growth rate of the C average is slowing down, right, it's actually become smaller, it's between uh, K11 to 21, it seems to be a good balance between the utility and the privacy. Now, of course, this is just experiment to say that what we find is that the CS database, the cancer database, is not, it does not have enough privacy. It has, if people are holding that data in violation of the agreement that when they acquire the CS database and linking with other database, then there will be a disclosure. So what we try to recommend is, is, uh, Okay, so basically our conclusion is that all the data sets that we review from 1991 to 2000 had a value of K equals one. So you can identify a, a patient from that data set in every one of the cases. So after doing you know, all this, we have to iterate so many times and after running Mondrian to find a better um, an, uh, anonymization we you know got to the conclusions so basically the first one for us is that c really needs to change the way that they provide access to this data set um, a simple email and a piece of paper where you sign is not really enough to provide privacy to these patients they need to do some privacy engineering against their database it is important. And um, when we were studying this, I thought, well, what does this have to do with really security? But really, it has to do with, so this is a nice combination field of study for data scientists and for security people. Um, they need definitely, so we did this uh, project at the beginning of the year. And as today, I still have the data set on my computer and I can keep using it, so there is no expiration date. Well, probably they know that once a, a data set is published, then it's, it, it, it's gone. 
um, they need to uh, categorize the access. So in the way that we told you that there is research, operations, and public. So our, our um, recommendation is that they should apply privacy engineering uh, methodologies, principles, and uh, have different values, you know? So the, the, the anonymization should be different. Like um, that it's up to uh, whatever study, studying probably the context of research, but that's something that can be easily done. So not, not release the same data set to everybody, but release different, you know, like one, two, three versions, depending on the type of user that is going to be really using this data. Um, uh, they need to obviously include some encryption and um, how we are supposed to dispose the data. Um, they need to also include some other concept in privacy engineering that is called differential privacy. And this apply to interactive uh, data sets. Um, again, our study was about the uh, static data sets, but they still have some information that you can access uh, through their website and you can run some queries. For that, they need to um, implement a differential privacy and they need to obviously um, uh, two-factor authentication from the security point of view. Right now, I mean, they even send you the username and password by email to access the data. I mean, that is the security that they have. Email, which in security, you don't do that, yes? Mm -hmm. You can read it. I mean, it's not even encrypted, so. And uh, they need to uh, work, uh, put it in the cloud. Um, so, privacy and anonymity is an absolute requirement on SEER databases. Um, we need to um, be mindful that that data is very precious and it's very sensitive, and uh, they need to um, be careful to be social engineer or something to release this data, and they're giving it basically for free to everybody. Um, the problem is that just the mere sign of a paper doesn't provide you privacy. And um, now with new uh, artificial, uh, artificial intelligence um, techniques like machine learning, you can, it's going to be easier, way easier to link patients to all the data sets that are already published. So, um, we need to do something, and uh, we hope this 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 field of uh, privacy engineering seems to be not really well understood in the you know in the data science field or in the security field, because I've read so many articles talking about privacy engineering that has nothing to do with any of these principles. They talk about privacy and talking about uh, laws and regulations, that is important, obviously. But you also need to be mindful and protect the data that you're releasing to the public. Um, we need to find out how we're going to balance utility, privacy. It's not going to be an easy way, but okay, you are data scientists here, so that it's a uh, homework for you. I hope that you have um, understand and enjoyed the, 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 this lecture. Um, yeah, one, one final thought is come back to the earlier uh, principle that you want to develop your trust between your service on using those data that potentially has, can identify a person. You want to build the trust between your service, your product, with the end user. So that trust is uh, very important. So that is something that I want to everyone be able to actually take this knowledge and be able to go back and apply to what you do on your data science project. And then we can continue to collaborate in this field because this field is still very new. It's been, has some academic publish in the past 10 years. There's some industry utilization, such as Uber work with UC Berkeley, um, working with a differential privacy, Query engine, uh, Google did some work in that. 
Uh, however, it's not enough. I think we need to be have everyone aware of this issue and be able to take action. So thank you.